Go to the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 6. And as you find your place there, you all have been getting a chance to know me. We've been here five months now. Um, You haven't run me off yet. There's a couple things that I've discovered in my life, okay? After 30 years of doing concrete, my dad's had me doing that since I was 13 years old, decided I'm not good at concrete. We've discovered in five months that I've been here, because it happened again today, I'm not good at plumbing, okay? (laughs) Take that how you want. Two minutes into this, you might discover if I am even cut out for preaching, okay? (laughs) So that might even be shorter. But as you all been getting to know me and my family, and we again, we just thank you so much for making us feel welcome here. Um, You know I have three daughters. Yes. How many... Now, you all have a special place in my heart. How many dads do we have here that has nothing but daughters? Stand up. (laughs) You got to stand up. We stick together, okay? Okay. Who Who has a man cave? Who's got a man cave? These men have paved the way for the man cave. You know what it used to be called? A padded room, okay? <laughs> you can have a seat. We're going to have a special prayer meeting for all of us that, uh, you know, I love, my, I love my daughters. I love my wife. I'm thankful that God's given them to me. I was never over excited about, oh, i got to have that boy, i got to have that boy. As you all know, my, some of you that have been around, my mom wanted a girl so bad. She had three boys, <laughs> Now there is not a grandchild that is not a girl, so she's getting her fill now in as a grandparent. So, um, so that's uh, that's exciting. Like I said, we have we understand each other, don't we, guys? We do. We do. <laughs> Are you easily intimidated? Just as I pointed out, we can be intimidated by those girls, can't we? They gang up on us. They start batting those eyes and different things. Are there people in your life that attempt to bully you? Now, they've never bullied me. I will give them that, okay? Um, Have they tried to, you know, through anger, manipulation, fear, whatever it might be? If you're a Christian here, and I think most of us are, I'd say probably like 99%, maybe even 100%. But if you're a Christian, the answer is definitely yes, isn't it? Here's the thing about intimidators. If you allow them to intimidate you, they will rob you of your joy. We all understand about intimidation. Don't have to go there, but this is how we know this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So we understand about intimidation, don't we? I've titled the message tonight... Focused and fearless. Amen. Focused and fearless. We've got our prize, and we've, we've talked about this in the youth department, and they're probably, the, the teens are going to say, we've heard some of this stuff. You probably have. You can zone me out. Don't be playing on your phones or whatever unless it's a good video. Let me know later, okay? But our focus is straight ahead, right? Who's our focus? Jesus Christ. The intimidator is Satan tries to throw everything at us, and he is throwing everything at us. He's attacking our marriages. He's attacking our relationships with friends. We've been doing relationships down in the youth department. He attacks every possible avenue that that he has, and he'll give it to us at full strength. We have heard this verse, and we understand it because if we've been saved any length of time, we've seen it. We recognize this and we understand this adversary. <clears throat> but the adversaries that come in the form of people, now spouses, no finger pointing, okay? This is not that time. Siblings, you can point fingers all you want. But Nehemiah is a man with three things. And we're just doing a little bit of review. Pastor has done an awesome job and an amazing job laying this out. So just give me, I'm just going to give a few points just here as we review, as we head on into this. Nehemiah is a man with a burden, a vision, and an intense commitment. Now, when you attach burden and vision and commitment to a strong relationship to your creator, 
which is God, we're unstoppable. There's nothing that can get in our way. There might be some trouble along the way, but there's no telling what we can accomplish. You are invincible. Nehemiah rebuilt this wall to keep God's people protected to dwell in so that they could continue to worship God. Nehemiah had to confess to God before he could even begin on this adventure. So we found where he had the prayers. He was prayed up, wasn't he? He had to get his heart right before he can even attempt to lead these people. He realized that, that they've been exiled from their home because of their sin. So let's start there. God doesn't bless disobedience, does he? We try to justify things to say, yeah, it's okay. God's blessed this. But we know in our heart that it's disobedience towards God. So he waits and he prays, Nehemiah does, until the opportunity comes and he seizes it. He grabs a hold of it. He prays, number one, and then he acts. Puts it right into motion. Remarkably, the, the king gives Nehemiah the opportunity to go back to his homeland, as well as the permission, the letters of safe travel, and the supplies that he needs. Whenever God's people set out to do God's work, they're going to be opposed. And we've seen that. How's he going to... Nehemiah is faced with a fear, an intimidator. How's he going to respond? Well, the same way you and I would. One of two ways. We will, we will either bow to that fear and allow it to rob us the joy that God has for us and how he wants to use us. Or number two, we will conquer that fear. You cannot have courage without fear. Have you guys ever heard that before? I've heard that. Um, here's a good phrase that I'd found. Courage. This is what courage is for the believer, okay? Courage is fear that has said its prayers. Think about that. Courage is fear that has said its prayers. There will be things in your life that will be fearful. And how do you respond? Nehemiah responds in prayer. Quick prayer. He doesn't wait around and he doesn't stop. He's continuing. Pray without ceasing. Continual. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Now it came to pass when Sambalet and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that, that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Through at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. Now about this time, the wall is about 98% complete. The walls are in place. The gates aren't in. What does that do with them? It leaves them unprotected at this point, doesn't it? They're still unprotected from the outside enemies. The enemies, which are on the outside of the walls, are going to make one last attempt. We've heard all about Sambalat and Tobiah, right? Not good company. This is a last shot. One last attempt before this wall is completed. In verse number two, that Sambalat and Geshep sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. Nehemiah refuses to fall into the acceptance trap. I'll explain it. You and I have this deep desire to be accepted, don't we? We talk about our teenagers, we talk about our children, but we never think to ourselves as an adult, we still deal with wanting to be accepted. We want to be accepted by our friends, our peers, our co-workers, but yet we don't we fall easily into that, and we warn our teenagers, don't we? But we can fall into it very easily. But it's not a bad thing, right? I want to be accepted by my wife. I want my wife to say, honey, I love you. Amen. Right? That's good. That's a good acceptance. Amen. The problem is, is we misplace that acceptance. Notice the position he's in, meeting with the elites. Some of the most powerful people in the world at that time, and they want to speak to Nehemiah. It's a big deal. He could easily feel like it's about time. You guys, you know, you want to talk to me now? Yeah, I need to be sitting at the big boy table. There's a tremendous pressure in our culture, isn't it? 
I mean, if someone, someone's got some that, it makes us feel good that someone's got, you know, if they got money, they got power, they got what, it feels, makes us feel good. It makes us feel like, yeah, I've made it. Status. How many times in culture do we hear the name or the word status? It's all about my status. There's tremendous pressure in our culture and society to make all things of personal sacrifices that in the end do you no good in order to be accepted and approved. Here's another statement that I found. Realize whose you are, not who you are. Who are we? We belong to God. In today's society, we sacrifice truth for acceptance, don't we? Have you heard this? All, re all religions are pretty much the same. We've heard that, right? At the core, we all have the same God. We all have the same eternity. We have, um, let's see, uh, let's see. But what we don't realize is, is what we're sacrificing is, is their God is different. Their heaven is different. Their hell is different if they even believe in it at all. Everything's about feeling good, isn't it? You know what? I'm good. I'm on this road. I'm serving my God. But what has their God done to them? And as we read on, we'll find out what uh, <clears throat> that the enemies there had noticed about, about Nehemiah's God. Notice Nehemiah does not need their approval. He's already got God's approval. He gave him the stamp of approval. Verses 3 and 4, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Whilst I leave it, and come down to you. Yet they sent unto me four times after the sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Nehemiah's response is basically, What part of no don't you understand? They've come after him four times, right? Four times. I worked for MCI, and I think Matt did too for a spell when we were in college. We were telemarketers. Thank goodness we don't have the telemarketers like we used to. We were those guys that would call you when you're trying to eat dinner or watch Monday night football and try to sell you long distance. Do you kids, how many, if you're under the age of probably 25, do you even have telemarketers calling to try to sell you long distance? No. So we would call and we would mess up their whole evening. <clears throat> and um, it wasn't a fun job. But what they taught us was to get more than one no. They wanted three no's, didn't they? Maybe four and if you could get five. And that's when things start getting a little testy and a little pushy. I went to the, you told me no, no means no, I move on to the next one. I'm not going to waste my time, but these guys were persistent. Some of those salesmen that was doing that, they made some good ones, and they might get, get them to say no three or four times and finally get them to say yes. They probably just want to get off the phone. But Nehemiah's response is basically, what part of no don't you understand? It's a waste of my time. It's a distraction. Distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. That's pretty simple, isn't it? I get distracted very easily. How about you guys? Amen. All us guys get distracted. Amen. I go, I get that text from my wife. Honey, I need you to pick up some milk and eggs. Got it. She's got to put the eggs in what she's fixing for dinner. Where's the milk and eggs? At the back of the store, right? Back of the store. I have a sweet tooth. <clears throat> I hit the snack cake aisle. I hit the, the, the candy aisle. There's always the chips aisle, and there's always the cookie aisle. I'll come home with a lot of sweets. I've been distracted. We really needed those eggs for that dinner because, honey, how many times does that happen? All the time. Even though she's got it in a text, I could read it for myself. I choose not to look at the list because I've been distracted by something else. Yeah, but look at what I got. And she's a bargain shopper. I'm not. I'll pay full price. I try not to, but my stomach gets the, the best of me. Matt teases me because I like pie. Blaine taught me a very important lesson this afternoon. Blaine Collins taught me a very valuable lesson with pie. <laughs> Wanda's already. <laughs> he said, there's two kinds of pie that's my favorite. I said, what's that, Blaine? 
He said, hot or cold. Doesn't matter anything there. Pecan, you know, pecan pie, coconut cream pie, cherry, peach, you name it. I've, I get distracted easy. And my stomach does a lot of distractions for me, which gets me into trouble. <clears throat> Do you know where our biggest distractions come from? Not my stomach. But we are our own distractions. We can place anything in the way, can't we? We can fill it with stuff that's just useless for us. Here's some of the phrases we probably all heard. When I retire, then I will serve God. When I get that big promotion, then I will give to the ministries of my church. When my kids graduate, how much time do our kids take in their sports? They take a lot of time, don't they? We wear ourselves out. We pass ourselves. I've probably sh shaken my fist at myself, passing myself, okay, up and down the roads. But we say, we make up all of, we've got all these distractions that get in our way. These distractions, they rob us of, our, of experiencing the joy of entering into what God wants to do to us and through us. When you know your priority, you won't waste time <clears throat> with, the, with any of these distractions. What is my purpose? What is my priority for being here on earth? Number one, to bring glory and honor to God, right? We know that and we understand that. And number two, bring blessing to those around us. Let's continue on in verses five through seven. Then sent Sambalat his servant unto me in like manner with the fifth, the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Okay, he's not just sending a personal letter. It's out there. He's letting everybody know. It's not more. It's not just this one-on-one -on -one now. An open letter. He's stating it out there to everybody. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen and Gashmu that saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach to thee, preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and, how, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Nehemiah, ex he's accused of gathering the Jews to rebel so that Nehemiah will be their king. He became a target. Nehemiah, at this time, see, the prophets, they're saying, you got the prophets on board saying that there's a king coming to Judah. This is about in the 450 B.C. time frame. Who's the coming king coming to Judah? The Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? It's not Nehemiah. Go to the book of Malachi. You'll find that that's, the, that's one of the prophets writing at the time, preparing the way for the Messiah. He had nothing to do with setting that. So they're setting a trap for him, pretty much. He became targeted. Many of us in here tonight, we're spiritual leaders, aren't we? There's many of us, I can look across the whole auditorium and I can point out leaders all the way through. We've got number, number not just our pastor. That's, our, that's, that's the one that's leading our flock, right? We need to pray for our pastor. We need to pray for our teachers. We need to pray for everyone that's up here on this platform, singing, bringing the direction of where our building program's going teaching our children. We've all got targets. Our families have targets on our backs. Constantly, they're looking to, to take us down. Our intimidator is uh, continually chasing after us. These men were making things up about Nehemiah. You'll hear some bad stuff. You've probably heard bad stuff about me. That's probably okay. It's pro some of it might be true. I hope not. <laughs> but gossip gets going around, doesn't it? Have you ever been around those people? We have in the past. I think we all have. When we're focused on what God has for us, we don't pay attention to, to what's being said around us. But when we're not as busy about things, we can find ourselves being part of that discussions, can't we? 
We've all had, had those oppor- or been around those people, that negative. We join in. Oh, yeah, well, I also heard this. Well, here's another one. And it keeps piling and piling. <clears throat> Nehemiah was one of the most hard working and gracious men that you could ever come across. Number one, we've learned throughout the series, he worked right alongside with these men, men and women and children. He even supported them with his own money out of his own pocket. You find in some of those cases as well, he fed them, he took care of them. He's one of the most gracious people that you're going to come across. There's no selfish interest in this for him. He's been making sacrifice after sacrifice. If you're in a leadership role, like I said, people are going to say things about you. He had a tremendous reputation. He had a good character. We need to have a good reputation. We're to be above the reproach. Don't buy into what they're saying. Don't, don't jump to defend yourself. Sometimes when we just remain silent, when we hear some of that, we've, had some, we've all probably faced some of that. The, the situations, well, they're saying this about me or whatever. I got to defend myself. Stop. No, you don't. Because your silence can be about your best defense because of the way that you live your life. They might see it as, oh, he's not saying anything. He must be guilty. It's not the case. People will know you by the way that you live your life. And they'll believe you for the way that you live your life. Here's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. I know many of you are familiar with him. Falsehoods usually carry their own refutation somewhere about them and sting themselves to death. Some lies especially have a peculiar smell, which betrays their rottenness to every honest nose. Your blameless life will be your best defense, and those who have seen it will not allow you to be condemned so readily as your slanderers expect. It has a stink to it. They know, well, Justin, you know, well, I don't remember him ever doing anything like that. But, you know, his character, his reputation. What do we raise our children with? We want them to have a good name because they are carrying our name, our reputation. When my child goes to someone else's house, they better be on their best behavior. We understand (laughs) that's a parental moment. Sorry about that. They better be on their best behavior because they have a name that they represent. They represent our family, our bloodline. Nehemiah represented a very amazing bloodline of Jesus, of God, the bloodline of God. This is all about having a good reputation. There will be people that think your silence is a form of guilt. We've covered that. Verse number eight, then I sent unto him saying, there is no, there are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. It's made up guys. It's fantasy. It's not true. For they all made us afraid saying their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. The hands will drop from the work when we get the distractions. And that's where we go back to when we're doing what God has for us to do. When we are focused on our ministry, when we are focused on whether it's the choir ministry, whether it's teaching our kids in junior church or in Sunday school or teaching an adult class, teaching the teens, the pastor leading us. When we take our focus off of that, what are we doing? What are we not doing? We're not doing the things of the work of God. We're going to drop our hands. We're going to. All right. It's a distraction, right? Verse number 10. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. All right. Shemaiah. You'll have to go back to Ezra to find out about the shady character of Shemaiah. Okay. He says he's of a priestly line. Okay. But he cannot produce the paperwork to back that up. Not at all. So he's coming in the form of, you know, he says he's a priest, but he's not. Okay. So this guy's a little sketchy to say the least. 
He calls for Nehemiah to hide out in the temple because they're coming to kill him. Nehemiah knows right away, it smells rotten. It smells fishy. Number one, Nehemiah says, I'm not really a guy that's allowed to go into the temple. He understood. Number one, he knows his Bible, right? He knows that he is not permitted to, to enter the temple. That's only for the priest. Number two, how am I going to lead these people if I'm hiding? These people are working, working away, working. And if Nehemiah is hiding, let's look at verses 11 and 12. And I said, should such a man as I flee, and who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceive that God had, sent, had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Nehemiah knew what was up. He had discernment, didn't he? He knew, he knew his Bible. His relationship with God was true. He could evaluate the truthfulness of what was being said to him. Whoa, guys, you're telling me to do something that the Bible clearly says not to do. Be careful. Sometimes even religious leaders may ask you to do something that's not right. We don't, I've not seen that here. Praise the Lord. We've seen it throughout our culture, though, haven't we? We've seen it through different religions. We've even seen it within the Baptist. But know your Bible. Don't just trust what the man is saying. Because if he's a man of God, he wants you following him anyway. Not him. So don't buy into what a man says. Know it for yourself. That man, and we are blessed with a man to lead us the way that he does. He follows what the Bible says. He gives us the example and he lives it out. The smell test, it's good. It's not rotten, okay? We might get a little, you know, B.O. smelling sometimes, but it's not, it's all good, okay? That's just a little physical thing here. That's because we're working, right? But be careful. Make sure that you're following God and not the man. Verse number 13, Therefore, was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. Do you know that there's a fear that will lead you to sin? There's also a fear that's very healthy. 2 a.m. You hear a glass break. What do you do? Men, we jump up. We grab a gun. Ready to bum rush whoever. I had a story just a couple, I saw a story a couple of days ago on Facebook. A friend of mine, he's out in D.C. He said he heard the back door open and close. D.C., they're just on the outskirts of, of the city, okay? And he hears his back door. He doesn't have a gun. He is out of shape. He is, I mean, he has no coordination. He said, so he started just he lowers his shoulder. He sees this this uh, silhouette of a of a man's body in his house. He goes to charge. And then all of a sudden he said he finally he slows himself down because he recognizes the bare feet that's on his floor. It's his 13 year old son. He pulls up. Hey, my bad. But he's guess what? He's in protection mode. Fear can be a good thing. There's also the type of fear that will cause us to sin. James chapter 4 and 17, you don't have to turn there because we're all familiar with it. Therefore, to know him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's better for me to lose my life through obedience than to save my life through disobedience. Let me share just, a story. some of y'all may know, Matt knows, uh, out of Wilmington, started a church in Greenville. Chad Fallis was the name of the fella that went to start the church. Chad was killed in a car accident. He's got a three-month-old and a two-year-old, two boys, beautiful family. He's doing what God says to do. He follows him in obedience and gone, just wiped out. Now, that got a hold of some of us men out of the Wilmington church because there was a guy that was following exactly 
what he knew he was supposed to be doing, and yet God still took him out. What if he hadn't? What could have been left behind the trail for his boys at that point? What, what, what hurt could he have had to go through and maybe to suffer? It's better to follow God in obedience and to lose our life than to be disobedient to him. So if Nehemiah runs away, that would be sin and would destroy his name. It would also be discouraging to the other workers. Well, where's Nehemiah? He's hiding. He's out there. He's not going to be out here. Doesn't go well with the work process, does it? They've got trials in their hands. They've got swords in their hands. Hey, we're building this wall with this hand. We're protecting the wall with this hand. Where's Nehemiah? Hiding up in the temple? He's not even allowed there. Does he not know what his Bible says? See what I'm saying? Now all of a sudden we're in a trap. Um, but that's not who Nehemiah is. Verse number 14. My God, thank thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. Notice what he does. He lays it right at the feet of the justice of God. God, you'll take care of this. You got it. You deal with it. Because you know what? I know where my faith is. I know where I stand and I know who, who I've put my trust in. Verses 15 through 16. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of, of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Their enemies dropped their heads. They, they're ready to charge. They don't have any gates. But by the time they get there, the gates are up. They're in place. 52 days, the wall's built. They're ready to go. Ugh. They hang their heads. They drop their shoulders. It's a whole different scenario, isn't it? They noticed what their God had done, and they began to question their own God. Look at what their God can do in just 52 days, rebuilt these walls. Verses 17 through 20 or through 19. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him because he was the son in law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son jo Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam the son of Barakiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. These guys have a lot of political and religious clout. They have a lot at stake here. These fellows is working for Tobiah. They began to compromise a long time ago. They compromised. They started intermarrying of different religions. Remember back to what I said, the different gods, how we compromise in our society. Their gods are different gods. Their heaven's a different heaven. And like I said, if they even have a hell, they're different. There's different rituals that goes against what God had said. So they've compromised their own well-being. They realize they had a lot to lose if they turned their backs on Tobiah. They began to try and convince Nehemiah, hey, Tobiah, he's really a good guy. Trust us. He, he's really, he's really good. They might have good intentions on the surface, but what's the real intentions when you start digging in? He's just misunderstood. He's all right. These guys got a lot to lose. They got paychecks that they're going to lose. They want Nehemiah to take it easy on Tobiah. Hey, if your God built these walls... Wow, in 52 days, there's no telling what you can do. You can destroy us. They recognize that. Nehemiah says in verse 19, Look, I'm not dumb. I know Tobiah wrote these letters to make me afraid. I get it. The guy wants me out of the picture. But I understand your fear. My fear, I don't have it. Remember? Courage is fear 
that said its prayers. Nehemiah's prayed up. He knows what his God is capable of doing. In closing here, if you fear God, you won't fear anything or any man. We've heard that. That's not anything you know, mind-blowing or anything. But if you don't fear God, you will end up fearing anything and everything. What's distracting you? What's distracting you right now from what God wants, to, wants you to do? Could it be sin? It could be fear. It could be the kind of fear that leads you to sin. What is it that we're not doing? God's called us to do something. Bring honor to Him, honor and glory to Him, and be a blessing to those around us. We've all got those distractions that come into our life. We all do. Kids' ball games, their practice, you name it. There's every night of the week we could be gone just to those things. What does that keep me from doing? Oh, that could keep me from serving here or doing this. Remember that saying, oh, wait till my kids are done. It'll be a lot easier. No, because then we'll be looking at retirement, empty nesting, retirement, whatever the next thing that comes up. But I want to encourage you. The Bible is full of stories of people as they turn their faces towards God. Then they step out in faith and they step into what God has for them. They become confident. They become risk takers. And they say, God, how do you want to use me? We've all got something to offer. Pastor made that very clear a week or two ago. We all have something to offer. Might be big, might be... I knew a lady. It's kind of gross. So here it goes. She could make the best pancakes. Amazing. Amazing pancakes. Yeah, yeah, you will die for her. They're fluffy. They taste good. Of course, you know me. I'm going to douse it with syrup. I'm a sweet tooth guy. This lady has the biggest heart. And she feels like her ministry is this. She loves cleaning toilets. Nope. Clean the toilets after the, after the pancakes and we're good. But that's her heart. She does every, before every service, she doesn't get paid for it. She does it because she says, you know what? There's not a lot that I can offer. I can make pancakes and I love her pancakes. But what she does on a weekly, bi-weekly, tri-weekly, she cleans toilets. And this is just in a small church. That's her heart. Doesn't matter how big, doesn't matter how small. We've all got a part. God wants to use each and every one of us. We say, Justin, I've got sin that's, that's stopping me right now. You know what? We know what to do. We pray right here at the altar. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're that 1% that I mentioned. There's 90, I said I believe 99% of the people here are saved. Maybe you've never experienced that point of salvation in your life. Could be. Romans 5.8. He commended this love toward us that while we were yet sinners, he didn't say, I'm going to wait till you're done sinning and then I'll save you. He said, while you are doused and drenched from head to toe in your sin, I still died for you. You might be here and might have that, that concern. We can help you with that. We've got people here. He wants to use us. He didn't create us just to be, just to have a project. He created us in his own image, in his own likeness, so that we can have fellowship with him. Let's all stand. Let's bow our heads. There's a lot of things that catch our attention, distractions. Constantly, There's many that I've not even touched on. But a big distraction is fear. Fear can be sinful. And that sin that's in our life, that's that stumbling block. That's our distraction. We get, we have our sin, whatever it might be. We take it off the shelf. We play with it for a little while and we put it back on the shelf. 
When we take that sin off that shelf, guess what we're doing? We're taking God's word, we're taking everything he has for us, and we're putting the, him on the shelf. How much more time are we spending with when those things are switched, when that sin is we're dealing with on a daily basis? And we've got God sitting on the shelf. I just want us to take a time. We'll, let's, uh, as, a, as the music starts to play and we enter our invitation. If there's someone here tonight that's not saved, we would love nothing more than to show you how to be saved. You might not even know what we're talking about. You might even be in a situation where you feel like you're so far from God. You know, maybe I was saved when I was a child or, 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 and I've just gotten away. God's waiting for you to call on him. Whatever your situation, whatever it might be, whether it's I need to